University of Guelph today. She is Professor of Family Relations and Applied Nutrition at U of G. And I was very excited to have her come and give a talk after seeing this study and then a couple of other um, press reports on, on the same study which came out just this summer. So it's pretty new, I would say, groundbreaking research and it's looking at the important central role of fathers and father involvement in the health outcomes and in particular I think you looked at nutrition uh, yep. outcomes of, uh, of uh, children and society in general. So we're going to hear about that. Um, I just wanted to quote just as a kind of trailer for the talk. This is from the study that you have in front of you. Uh, this is Jess Haynes speaking. Much of the research examining the influence of parents has typically examined only the mother's influence or has combined information across parents. Our results underscore the importance of examining the influence fathers have on their children to develop strategies to help fathers support the development of healthy behavior among their children. And as I was just preparing um, uh, to have her here, I was looking at some of the other research, and there was an, another uh, a piece of research that came out the same month from the University of Michigan, which found that fathers play a surprisingly large role in their children's development from language and cognitive growth to social skills, according to new research. So this seems to be something that's catching on. We're very glad to see that, and we're very glad that Jess was able to join us from Guelph. So please help me in welcoming Jess Haynes. so much for the invite. I'm really thrilled to be here. It's, um, a, as Justin mentioned, sort of a new topic and one that I'm really excited about, so it's great to be here. And um, Oscar is my son, who's also with me. I'm a parent of two, uh, but I got to bring Oscar along with me, and we've been here for a while because we had a great commute in from Guelph, which has been lovely because it's just been nice to sort of get the feel of this place, which is really welcoming and lovely, so thank you so much for having me. So I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes. Um, if you've had a long week, and you think the last thing I can do is listen to someone talk for 30 minutes. I'm going to tell you what my key take-home points are, what you're going to learn here, and so then after you've heard that, if you want to turn your brain off for the next 30 minutes, you can. So I'm going to talk about the fact that we have a real gap in research that is examining the impact that parents have, or sorry, that fathers have um, in the development of their children's health, behavior, health behaviors and weight outcomes. I'll, I'll give you some data to prove that there's really a gap there. Um, there's really, the limited research that does exist suggests that fathers are important. And I'll talk about two studies, one that Justin mentioned and another one that shows the importance of fathers. And then really, uh, my last key point is really that researchers need to be intentional about involving fathers. And I'll talk a bit about what we need to do to make that happen. Uh, so for many years, research really has taken a very traditional view of families, and certainly of, hello, <laughs> of uh, parents' roles. Welcome, do you want to grab a seat? Or? No, I'm just going to. OK. <laughs> Um, so I've taken a really traditional role of thinking about families and parents. Um, and typically we've really identified mothers as the primary caretaker, the one who does the procurement of food, the preparation of food, um, as well as lots of the parenting around the children's eating and activity behaviors. But really as we see sort of some of the changing trends that exist in Canada, this is a fairly antiquated so um, the, number, the number of dual earner families with children has increased substantially and it's estimated to be about 70%. Um, the number of stay-at-home dads has also um, increased substantially with about 11% uh, of uh, fathers identifying as stay-at-home dads. And then um, within families of single parent families, about 20% have been estimated to be with, um, uh, or the single parent families, or their, the children actually live with their dad. So certainly this idea that um, you know, our thought that moms do it all certainly is not correct. Um, and as a result of these cha changing trends, fathers are very involved in food procurement, food preparation, and the parenting of their children. Um, for example, in approximately 40% of North American households, the fathers are actually, or the males are actually the primary grocery, uh, grocery uh, shoppers. And the grocery industry is aware of these trends, and they've actually identified that men and women appear to actually even shop differently. Um, so they're often wanting much more efficiency, sort of a one-stop shop. Uh, they're less likely to compare products. Apparently, we also make our grocery lists differently. Uh, moms will often, or uh, women will often think, I'm going to make burritos, and then make their grocery list such that they'll think, I need tortillas, and that goes in the bread section, and I'm going to need some beans, and that'll be in the can. And so that's sort of how we create our lists. Um, the grocery industry has identified men will write tacos, right? And then they know that there's lots of different ingredients that go along with that. Well, the grocery stores have responded. I need you to move forward, sorry. My 
my, uh, there we go, thank you. I just realized I have my, uh, my, uh, my pointer may not be following along with me. Um, so they've actually responded. So grocery stores have responded to the fact that there's more men and that they shop differently. Now you will see whole sections where all the ingredients for a meal, such as a taco, are all together. You'll notice bananas now beside cereal. And women will think, well, what the, that, that doesn't make any sense. And the men are like, perfect, it's all very convenient. Right? And off they go. So while the grocery industry um, has certainly responded to the fact that these, that these trends are changing and men are much more involved uh, in many of these um, sort of typically viewed as sort of women's job, our research has not kept pace. Um, my colleague, Kirsten Davison, and she's at the Harvard School of Public Health, did a review of research exploring parenting research uh, that looked at parenting and obesity outcomes of children. And what she found was there were 667 total studies that looked at this topic. Uh, about 50% included mothers and fathers. 36% uh, included mothers only. And only 1% had fathers only. And you might be thinking, this is not that bad, right? 50% has both moms and dads. But actually, if you do a deeper dive into that research, only 10% of those studies actually have enough fathers that, it, that something can be said that sort of, uh, that where we were able to look at mothers and fathers separately. So normally what happens is that the call went out and asked sort of, we're looking for parents of young children or parents of adolescents, and about 98% of them that responded were mothers, about 2% were dads. They were put lumped all together, and we said parents do this, and you couldn't look and see whether things look different for mothers and for fathers. And the research suggests that things might actually be somewhat different. Um, there was a longitudinal study of over about 3,000 um, Australian families. And children who had an obese father and a healthy weight mother were over 10 times more likely to be obese four years later than children who had two healthy weight parents. But that same association was not found in families where there was an obese mother and a healthy weight father. So suggesting that something about the overweight father had a stronger impact on whether or not the child ended up uh, overweight or obese as opposed to just the mother. So something may be different about what's going on with the father. Is that for girls and boys? It was, yeah. Yep. Some of my research suggests it might look different for, for men, but, or for boys. So you might be wondering, so why, why aren't these men in the research? And so again, my colleague Kirsten Davison at Harvard School of Public Health tried to answer that question. And she did an online survey with about 300 men to ask them, or 300 fathers, to ask them about, you know, why, what barriers might exist for them participating in research. And the main one, they said, 86% of fathers said they simply weren't asked. And as I mentioned, we asked sort of a very general way, you know, we're looking for parents, but may not ask specifically for fathers. The other interesting finding she said had was that 20 to 40 percent of mothers did not encourage them to participate. Okay, and in some qualitative work that dug deeper into this, it looked like often what will happen is when the call comes out for research looking at child health, the m mothers will kind of say, "Oh, I got this. This is in my wheelhouse." I'm going to do it. And so, you know, in the division of labor, the father says, okay, you got it, and they move on. So the idea that our general calls out that say, hey, we're looking for parents uh, of children or parents of adolescents may not be effective in engaging parents, but actually either we want to make sure that we say into parent families, we want both of you engaged in this research, or a specific call that says, we're interested in dads, we want to know more about dads, and then therefore they may be more likely. We're asking them, and then we're also sort of circumventing um, the mother saying, oh, that's my role. Any questions as of yet? No? All right. So as I hopefully convince you, there really is a gap. We don't know enough about fathers. And some of the work that we've done in our team is trying to help fill that gap. I'm going to talk about some results from two different studies. One is the Growing Up Today study, which is a Harvard-based study, is the one that um, Justin mentioned as, as the intro. And the second one is the Guelph Family Health Study, um, which is just uh, 100 kilometers or so off the road, and I'll tell, tell you a bit about that one as well. So first, GUTS, or the Growing Up Today study. This is a nationwide sample of about 26,000 adolescents. Um, uh, throughout America. Um, they are the offspring of nurses in the Nurses Health Study 2 uh, study. Nurses Health Study 2 was about 116,000 nurses throughout the um, America really looking at um, 
women's health broadly. So the Growing Up Today study said, well, let's figure out what's going on with our kids. So these are all children and nurses that were recruited into this study. And we use this data to explore how the quality of the relationship with both the mother and the father um, was associated with these adolescent weight outcomes and their weight-related behaviors. So we measured parent-adolescent relationship quality by asking the, the adolescents themselves to talk about, to use their, what they thought, their uh, satisfaction with conflict resolution, communication, uh, emotional support, and time spent together. <laughs> um, and so what they did was we used a validated skill that asked them questions like, I am satisfied with how often my, um, how much time I spend with my mother or father, and they answered separately for the mother and the father. The response option was on the Likert scale that ranged from strongly disagree to agree and had a neutral one in, um, in the middle, so it could range from one to five. And what we did was anyone who had a mean range or mean score of four or higher, suggesting that they agreed with most of those statements, were identified as having a high relationship quality with their with their mother or their father. And 50% of the participants reported a high relationship uh, quality with their father, and it was about 60% for mothers. So 60% of adolescents reported a high relationship quality with their father. <laughs> and so this is what we found. So we looked at um, the association between the relationship quality. Uh, we compared high versus low for weight, and then a number of weight-related behaviors. So the, this included eating, uh, disordered eating, um, physical activity, uh, sleep, um, fast food intake, and um, sorry, I, I'm sure you can't get there because I can barely see. So sugar sweet beverage and screen time. And what we found, and this is the results for the girls, and um, because it's sort of difficult to see, I'll sort of walk you through it. What we did find was there was a significant association. So uh, girls who reported a high relationship quality with their, uh, with their father had lower risk of obesity. They had lower risk of disordered eating behaviors. Um, they had lower risk of eating fast food uh, more than one time a week, so were less likely to eat fast food. They were more likely to be physically active, and they were more likely to get adequate sleep, so seven hours of sleep. And so that was relationship quality with their father. Those results all, for, to, for the girls mirrored what they saw for the mothers. So the same associations were seen for those who had a high relationship quality with their mother. But for boys, things looked a little different. Um, so the same associations were seen in that among those males who reported a high relationship quality with their father had lower risk of obesity, had lower risk of disordered eating, um, also had lower risk of um, eating fast food, more likely to be physically active, and more likely to get sleep. So that looked the same as it did for the girls. But uh, we only saw the relationship with the decrease in over, being overweight or obese or in weight status among the, um, for the relationship with the father. So um, even though males reported a high relationship with, or high relationship quality with their mother, if they did, they, that was not protective for overweight. So we only saw that when they reported a high relationship with their father. So some suggestion that maybe for the same sex um, child, that uh, the parent relationship, there might be something going on for those men um, or for those boys. But we need definitely more etiologic research. We don't know exactly what's going on. So to know the full mechanism of how um, the, the relationship qualities leading to lower obesity risk among boys for their fathers but not their mothers, we don't know the answer. But um, could certainly look at more research to sort of figure out what's going on there. So some of the key take-home points from the Growing Up Today study. Um, adolescents reporting more positive relationship with their mothers and their fathers reported healthier weight-related behaviors. But for obesity risk, males may be more affected by the relationship with their fathers than with their mothers. Any questions about that study? Yeah. Does that suggest that girls are more adaptable to their relationship with either parent than the boys are? And Sure. Um, so we don't really know. Um, it may be um, meaning that for them, they just need a good relationship with either parent. It doesn't matter uh, if it's their dad or their mom. Potentially, um, there may be something 
um, specific about role modeling and role modeling with the same sex parent that's going on with the so meaning that, that if it's your dad who has healthy behaviors and you might be more likely if you're um, a son if you have the same sex that you'll be more likely to um, you know, want to model them the correlation between health, obesity or lack of obesity and the relationship with their mother was exactly the same as it was with their father. Correct. Yeah. Uh, you were right. So it's not as. Uh, so I don't know what's going on exactly. Okay. We don't. We do not know what the. Did you have another thought though? Maybe not. Uh huh. Uh huh. Any other thoughts about what? Yeah. Uh, just another way to look at this negative relationships. The father has negative. Yes. Yes, yes, uh, yes, and um, so the idea too that when we're thinking about, um, so in my world we're also often thinking about how do I support the development of healthy behaviors, um, but that maybe for some families the, the place you'd have to start is on the relationship uh, before you're focusing on um, some of those behaviors. Um, it doesn't matter what the family is, we're able to look at those cases where Can't hear the question. Oh, so the question was, could you look at, did we uh, code for a um, kid who has a relationship, good relationship with both versus bad relationship with both? We didn't look at that, but you're right, that would be interesting. And then you could also look at congruence, so good relationship, mom, uh, bad relationship, dad, vice versa, and see if the association is stronger. You're right, that would help. That would be an interesting way to look at that, too. Yeah. Is this a Harvard study? Yeah, so, uh, so, um, pardon me? Can't hear the question. Uh, wondering if it was, uh, if this was a Harvard based study, and it is, um, Guts is based out of the Channing Laboratory. Yeah. Great. Sorry. And the second study we're working on is the Common Family problem. Health Study. And this is a family based cohort study of families with young children. Uh, we have two aims with this study. We're trying to identify early life risk factors for um, the development of obesity and chronic disease in kids. And then we're also testing family-based strategies uh, to promote healthy behaviors early in life in kids. Our long-term goal is to recruit 3,000 families and follow them for 20 years. Uh, but we started small before we jumped into that. And we started with a pilot study with 44 families. And I'll talk a bit about that. We wanted to take a really broad understanding of families. So, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, we wanted to have a really broad understanding of families. So uh, there's nine of us that work on the study from across campus. And so we're looking at how things like the social and family context, um, level of parent stress, uh, fam level of family functioning, those type of things, as well as genetics can influence the diet, physical activity, and sleep behaviors of both the children and the parents how that might affect the microbiome or the gut, the bugs that we have in our gut, uh, how that can affect their blood biomarkers, so the amount of blood, uh, uh, fat in the blood, sugar in the blood, that type of thing, uh, as well as body composition, so their height and weight uh, and uh, level of body fat. So as I mentioned, we started small before jumping in and trying to do 3,000 families. We thought we'd try to figure out, uh, um, you know, figure out what we did, did well and not so well right from the get-go. So we did a pilot study with 44 families. Uh, we had 44 moms and 35 dads participate, and we had specific asks. So in two-parent families, we wanted everyone who was, we wanted both parents to participate. And the average age was 36 years. About 60% were identified, of uh, parents were identified as overweight or obese, which is very similar to what we see in our national average here in Canada. 84% um, were Caucasian, <coughs> which is fairly similar to the Gulf. Demographic definitely does not represent uh, cities like Toronto. Uh, and about 10% had an annual income of less than 39,000, which at the time was the cut point for low income. Um, and we're now working with public health to do some um, targeted uh, outreach with more low income and uh, socioeconomically diverse populations as we move to the larger study. We've worked to get really extensive data to so try to understand families. So we have detailed diet data on both the parents and the children. We're looking at their weight and body fat. We are measuring their physical activity and sleep using objective measures where we're actually having the kids wear accelerometers that will measure how much they sleep um, as, as well as how active they are. 
We're asking lots of, uh, we're asking for lots of biological measures. We have blood food stool samples as well as saliva for genetics and blood pressure. And then they answer us, give us lots of information about what their family context looks like as well. So um, we measured these families at baseline and then had them come back at six months. Um, and we had very high retention, higher than I've ever had in any study I've worked on. We had 96% of families came back uh, at the six month mark and 100% told us they would recommend uh, the, fam the study to a, fam a friend or family. So certainly that it was an acceptable study to them. We had some direct quotes from families. This family told us that this study really helped them to refocus some of their attention on eating habits and overall health. Um, and we also uh, created a family council. So as we move forward and think about our larger study, we want to make sure it's relevant to families, uh, feasible for them to do, and appropriate sort of in their lives. And so uh, we asked, we sent out an email to all 44 families asking for participants to be on a family council who would meet with um, us uh, three times a year and give us some feedback on what, what we're thinking about as we move forward. So the first email went out and we got 10 moms back in about a week. And so then we made a specific ask and said, we really want to know about, we want um, dads to participate too. And we got five dads. Um, so um, I, uh, building on sort of what Kirsten Davis's research said, is you have to have, have a direct ask. Our first ask, we just got parents, or we just got uh, moms, but it's been really great to have five dads to tell us about, you know, what do they like about the study? How do we engage more dads? You know, what kind of things do they want to um, see happen in the study? So our next step, uh, next steps are to some ongoing recruitment of families. Uh, we recruited an additional um, 38 mothers and 29 fathers, so we now have a total of 82 mothers and 64 fathers in the overall study, and we'll continue on with that recruitment. But we also have some pilot data, or using the pilot data, we have some results um, of the roles of mother and father in the children's weight-related behaviors. And specifically, we looked at how mothers and fathers' feeding practices um, are associated with child nutrition status. So when I'm talking about feeding practice, what are we talking about? These are the types of behaviors that we do uh, when we interact with our children and their feeding. Right, and so, well, based on previous experience, so you may do things because that's how you were fed. You may do the exact opposite because you didn't like how you were fed. Uh, you may also, um, <coughs> Often you're trying to, of course, to promote the health of your child, um, often want them to have a healthy intake. Um, so many of these things, so some of the things that families will do, one is a, a control measure. We have to ask about things like, do you have your child clear their plate? So make sure that they clean their plate and eat all that's on there. We call that sort of pressure to eat or control. Um, emotion regulation. Do you use food, you know, to soothe your children? Do you, do you use it to make sure that they, you know, if they fall down or hurt themselves, do you make sure that you have something that they like as a way to sort of manage that? Um, do you encourage balance and variety in their diet? Um, do you create an environment that has healthy food as, as accessible as available? Do you use food as reward? So, um, is it that if a child behaves the way you want them to, they get the food that they want? Uh, vice versa, you know, if, if they don't eat the carrots, do they get, do they not get dessert? Those type of things. Um, involvement, do you involve your children in the food preparation? Uh, modeling is to try to make sure that your child sees you do the kind, eat the kind of things that you'd like them to eat. Uh, monitoring is, do you sort of measure? Do you think about how much um, throughout the day, would you monitor how much fruit or vegetable they have or how much different types of foods? Um, do you pressure them to eat? Do you have restriction? Um, do you restrict some of their food? Um, do you restrict their access to healthy food? And there's sort of two motivations that researchers are interested in. Do you restrict because you're worried about their health? Or do you restrict because you're worried about their weight? Um, and so those are the measures we use. This is the Comprehensive Feeding Practices Questionnaire. Um, measures all these 11 feeding practices. So both the mother and the father filled out the survey so we know about what their practices are uh, with regard to their children. We also looked at child, uh, so the outcome was child nutrition risk. And we used a measure here that's been developed at Guelph. It's called NutriStep, which is a 17 item uh, questionnaire that parents fill out uh, that tells us a bit about their child's nutritional intake. And if they have a higher score on the NutriStep, they're at higher nutritional risk. And so what did we find? We found that among both mothers and fathers, 
um, both mothers and fathers who encouraged a balanced and varied diet and who provided a healthy home environment um, and who involved their children in uh, meal preparation had children with a lower nutrition score. We also found that um, fathers who modeled healthy behavior also had children who had a lower nutrition score. And this wasn't found for mothers, so this suggests that um, thinking about, you know, what's the role that fathers, uh, what, you know, what did we see with regards to fathers related to a child's lower weight, it is possible that part of that mechanism has to do with modeling and that, um, and I know clinically I used to see this, so a family would come in and they would say to us, uh, my child won't eat vegetables. And I, my, my, often my next question would be, so do you two eat vegetables? And often I'd hear a mom who said yes, and a dad who said no. And of course the children want to do what their parents are doing, so that uh, this data sort of backs up what I would see nutritionally, that um, parents matter, and in this case, with regards to modeling, it looks like dads really matter. Any questions about those? Yeah. Um, you defined how a, 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 an intact family was used, but what defined a, a single parent family, and were there any that were led by dads? We have we have not yet had a family come in that's um, le that came in led by a dad. Uh, we do I shouldn't say that. So we have many. No, we don't have any single parent families who showed up at our study with um, the dad coming in as a single dad. We do have single moms who showed who are in our study. We now have dads who are single because there's been divorces since we've now followed these families for 18 years, and so we do have. Um, they're both still in the study, and so now they're a single parent, but they weren't the... But we certainly, I would say about 25%, so we, when families come in, we have parent one and parent two, is the way we use the language. And parent one is the first one who made contact with us. And about 25% of those are men. And what defines a single family? The, the, the question is really, how much sure. involvement, how much, or how much lack of involvement does a second parent have to have in order to not be considered two-parent family? Oh, um, in our study we don't, so uh, we do not have... So you only look at parents that are living together as parents that are... No, we, um, I want to make sure this is in this study. We have another uh, study that's just going in right now that um, the way we define it is you have to have their child has to live with you 50% of the time when we're looking at stuff like this. So if we're thinking about your association with some of these. Um, I can't remember if in Guelph we have, in the Guelph Family Health Study, if we have the same cut point. Yeah. Um, but that was that's typically used, I have to say, in batch of, um, when we think of some of this. Um, but for example, the families who've split up and are in our family, I don't think we've ever asked them how often is your child living right at present. And you still count them as, as dual parent family. Yes, they're still the parent for that child. Yeah. But the family is still a dual parent family. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we haven't gotten there yet, to be honest. We haven't had to write up the now what does it look like, but that's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. And right now we're following both, and hopefully they both stay in the study, but it would be interesting. Yeah. yeah um, I, I just want to relate the Goa Family Health Study with the going up to the study. Actually, I went, I read through the going up to the study. But um, you talked about um, genetics as being a strong association to obesity, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, but I noticed the gut study, that's the going up to the study, never talked about genetics being a strong confounding variable, which you have used. Right. And that would have Right, so you think we, uh, you're suggesting we should have adjusted for parent BMI? Not BMI, as in probably family, family history, uh -huh. or finding a way to ask about are people in your family, are they obese? Because genetics and obesity is a very strong confounding variable. Sure. Which the gut study didn't talk about. Right, right. And I think, um, so we know that genetics certainly um, plays an important role in sort of setting, absolutely. Um, and then depending on, and we know this from animal studies and human studies, depending on what environment you're set into within, uh, um, what's the line, genetics plus, you know, 
genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger is sort of the idea. So it is, um, so I think some of this stuff does tell us over and above genetics, what are some other things that um, can lead to... Yeah, but what I'm saying is, uh, I yeah. think the gut study, uh -huh. the least, very, actually genetics uh -huh. that was absent in the gut study, is a strong confounding variable. Right. Which actually, um, even in the limitations, they didn't talk about it as probably right, right. what they missed. For sure, for sure. And we did it just for for mothers. So in the because they're nurses and they're children of the nurses, we have the mother's BMI, but we don't have the um, father's. So we've adjusted in the one we adjusted for um, uh, mother BMI at a, uh, I think at age 18 is how we did it. Um, and then it didn't make a difference, and we still saw those same associations over and above mother. But you're right, the gap is we don't know what dad's, what's dad. going on with dad. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's an important limitation. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just speaking towards that point as far as where the focus of that gut study was specifically from my understanding that was more related towards towards the actual habits of the mother and father and the influence towards the child, if I'm understanding as far as what the reports are actually saying. So while genetics would actually play a certain factor, I'm, it's just, it's not something in which I saw that that study was that main focus. It was just mainly the influence that um, the mother and father had. Not discrediting as far as where the genetics came into play, but just seeing as far as where the encompassing focus of the study appeared to come from, just looking at it in first glance. Um, now, of course, I don't have like the full behind yeah, yeah. the scenes piece, but that's like from the layperson's perspective as far as how the information is presented, that's how I feel as far as where the focus was is being received. Yeah, and that was our goal was to understand what are the factors in the general family environment, like relationship quality, um, that may be associated with some of those uh, behaviors and uh, weight outcomes for sure. And we did look at the behaviors too to try and get at, so it wasn't just the weight outcomes, but also because of course uh, those behaviors are important no matter what weight status you're at. Um, but yeah, um, that was sort of our uh, the thrust. But certainly it is important to think about the genetics. Yeah, yeah. Is the right, so the parent-adolescent um, relationship quality question came from um, uh, a study that looked at um, relationship quality and I think son skin cancer behaviors, etc. But it had been a validated study with um, fam uh, both adol and with adolescents reporting the relationship quality. In that study, we also looked at family functioning, and that we used the McMaster um, family assessment device, which is a 12-item question about sort of general family functioning. Mm -hmm. That's totally the right one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the take-home points here are really that parental feeding practices seem to be associated with child nutrition risk, um, and father modeling of behaviors um, maybe have a stronger influence as compared to a, to a mother. So certainly some suggestion that we need to make sure we figure out how to engage fathers, uh, both in our behavior interventions where we're trying to change behavior of the whole family, but also trying to understand some of these risk factors associated with some of these behaviors. And so with the Guelph Family Health Study, some future things we're looking at, we have measures of both mother and father, um, media, physical activity, and sleep parenting. So not just feeding, but what else do they do around limiting screen time? What kind of modeling do they do around those behaviors? And so we can explore some of those behaviors um, too, in addition to the eating. Uh, we're looking at parenting stress. We're looking at co-parenting. So understanding how do families who, uh, how do families of two-parent families, or actually, um, families who may be um, not living together, but how do they manage co-parenting? Specifically, the stuff we're interested in is around nutrition, physical activity, sleep, those type of things. If you have one perspective, uh, you know, that I don't care how much media they have, and on the other side, you care a lot, uh, another parent really cares a lot, uh, you know, how do people navigate that, and how does that, uh, maybe incongruence, for example, how does that affect the kids' behaviors? Also looking at parent mental health. We're also looking at both mother and father uh, food skills and how that's associated with the kids' dietary intake, their dietary intake, and um, because we're at the University of Guelph, and, uh, uh, we're also looking at waste. So how is the level of food skills associated with the amount of food waste that families have? So, and again, we're going to be able to look at that both in mothers and fathers and see if there's a difference. And I'm 
up for more questions. Thank you. Thank you. You did a good job. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, getting back to the first study, uh, yeah. because the selection was from nurses, uh, would that not have biased the study uh, in some way? Because maybe nurses were acting in similar ways as opposed to like a more random selection? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so when we think about generalizability, these folks are health focused, um, right. health focused, and we do see some evidence that things look a little different in these families. So for example, the smoking rates in the Growing Up Today study is lower than we see in the national um, sample. Our obesity rate look fairly similar. Um, these kids are a little more physically active. So certainly um, we can imagine that some of these results that we've seen for the Growing Up Today study sample may look different in one that's more socioeconomically diverse, um, folks who aren't uh, focused on health, for example. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, did you did you look at any infants and relationships with parents? We had not in this study. So uh, the Guelph Family Health study, the kids are age eighteen months to five years, um, and then um, the growing up today study, they're adolescents, so they were actually late teens, sort of early um, early adulthood. Um, we are right now. So Kirsten Davison and I um, are putting in a grant to. The guts cohort now is aging, and they are now the age where they become parents. So we are um, we're putting in a grant to look at it's a, it's entirely a fatherhood grant where we want to follow the fathers and try to and identify their. Uh, so one of the cool things about the Guelph well Family Health Study, no, growing up today study, they need to start with different letters. At the beginning, <laughs> um, is we have the the progression of their um, activity uh, and uh, eating behaviors before they were parents and then after. And so one of the things that would be interesting is looking for fathers, what, is it, what does fatherhood do to your own health behaviors? Um, how is that associated with the kind of parenting practices you do? How is your transition to parenthood? Is that an easy go for you, is it less? And how is that associated? So in that one, we will be able to look at what does it look like for infancy and what does it look like for older? Because one of the interesting things we want to measure there is involvement. And of course, when we think about food involvement, you might think have less involvement than infancy when mom may be more in charge of particular if she's breastfeeding and then it might increase and sort of what does that look like but we don't we haven't yet looked at infants. There is a difference in um, enzymes that are produced. But it's one of those uh, on the uh, when infants uh, in particular are in proximity of either parent. Mm. And so the, the so baby uh, uh, produces different hormones, right. depending on, no, is that what so you're saying? Yeah. Depending on, oh, right. very cool. That's right. So it would probably be similar, or there would be something like that at older ages. Yeah, really interesting. Awesome. So you said you did kids uh, 18 months to 5 years old? Correct. Why do you not do like kids 18 months? Oh, great question. So we were looking at early life influences. So uh, we were thinking about, because we think that we, er, research suggests that early in life, those things that you do when you're just figuring out how much TV you're going to watch or just how much physical activity you're going to book, that predicts how much you do when you're 8 and when you're 12. So that's why we really want to understand that so that we can get you on the right track. Are you going to research? We are following these folks all the way up. So we want to follow our joke to their families is we want to follow them forever. So, we want to keep, so hopefully we'll see what it looks like when they're 12. <laughs> so all the kids that, uh, all the parents and the kids that we treated, um, they all have the same thing that they have the same The kids are, yep. 18 months to 5 years. 18 months to 5 years, yep. Yep. But they have birthdays. <laughs> yeah, some are 6 now. Yeah. Is there a certain age where the behaviors they learn from their parents um, become set in these young people and they carry on to adulthood? So there's some evidence certainly that some of the ones that we've seen, uh, that, that these types of behaviors do track. Um, there hasn't been um, that many studies that have been able to follow to know exactly what happens each time as they move on. But certainly, yes, that, that some of those behaviors that we see um, established early do seem to track. What we're excited to see, my hypothesis is so lots of research happens among adolescents because adolescents notoriously have bad intake, 
we watch too much TV, they stay up too late, all of these things. And what I think is really interesting is if we work with families early and help them establish healthy behaviors, my hypothesis, and I don't have any data to show this, but is that I think for in adolescents, of course, there's a bit of finding autonomy, they rebel, but I think the kids who have the healthy habit to jump back to um, can go back there. And if, But if you've only ever had sort of unhelpful behaviors that you don't have that pattern to head back to. So what's exciting about this study is we'll be able to follow that a bit better. Well, um, guts didn't start, we didn't measure the kids till they were 9 to 14 years of age, so we don't know what it looked like early on, uh, whereas in the above family health study we'll be able to sort of get a sense of that. Yeah? How difficult in these kind of studies, how you disentangle the importance of genetics and environment? Someone who's predisposed to Badly, but genetics, they don't have potentially pass the genes to the offspring, and also it potentially are more likely to create the environment that's not conducive to healthy people. Right, and that's why we do have a geneticist on the team so that they will measure the kids' genetics because, of course, depend every kid will have different. So, one of the first studies we're doing on genetics is genetics of taste. And there um, are um, polymorphisms that suggest that some of us like sweet more than savory. Um, some have real aversion to bitter, uh, those type of things. So what would be interesting is to exactly that. When you have different kids who have different genes, uh, different taste genes, which is possible within a family, and then they're in the same environment, can we tease out a bit about what's the influence of some of the, um, the genetics and what's the influence of I mean, the best studies do that, of course, are, gene are twin studies with identical twins. Um, but I have a good research or close researcher friend who's like, but then twins are just odd, right? It's a, it's a, you know, it's a different experience being a twin too. So, uh, but that's some of the best research is trying to, and there are a few big twin cohorts, uh, particularly in the UK, that are trying to disentangle some of that. Yeah. And we I, we have some twins in our study. Have you found the gene that uh, causes people to dislike Brussels sprouts? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so that there truly is one. Do you know this? Really, no, there no. really is one. So um, there's if you have the bitter, uh, if you uh, if you have um, what you're called is a super taster, and what you do is have a, um, a strong sensitivity to bitter. So things like Brussels sprouts and broccoli and cauliflower, red wine dark chocolate can all be, um, the idea is that those folks taste that a lot stronger than um, folks who don't have that gene. So there really is um, a gene. Now that does not mean that if you're a super taster you never eat those. What can happen of course is that with feeding behaviors, so some kids, um, when we introduce new foods to children, some kids take to it right away. And then some kids can take up to 12 times before they'll take a new food and uh, and accept it. So a bitter, if you have, if you are a super taster, it might take you, you know, what we would tell a parent is not that, oh, they, they'll never eat broccoli, but you might have to do, you know, sort of be more patient while they're trying to uh, establish that taste. So there is a gene. <laughs> yeah, so if, you are, if you really want to know more, it's a super taster gene. Actually, a fair bit's been written about it, actually. So you really, we, you still haven't figured out like why, like if the eating patterns of the father influences children, both the, the girls and the boys, you haven't figured out like what's what are the mechanics. There? What's the mechanism? No, it looks like modeling matters a lot. Uh -huh. So um, another study just came out recently that found the same thing that father modeling of unhealthy foods predicted more unhealthy foods than and mothers didn't. Um, so the, it appears that father modeling matters a lot, um, but the, uh, we have not figured out the exact mechanism of how, um, why some of those results we see look to be stronger for um, dads, for example, around the weight. You know, the yeah, this, um, actually, yeah. I checked some things, you know, and um, I saw that fathers were found to be much more encouraging towards um, healthy eating, unlike the women. Uh -huh. Fathers are also much more, they are more likely to encourage their kids to involve in exercise. And that could also explain why 
Absolutely. Yeah, actually, more these and are, more. Yeah. Invest, you know, these are from researchers. Yeah, yeah. And more, there's definitely more. Um, as Justin said, there's much more interest in thinking about what, what is the role of fathers. Um, there's a group in Australia, in Newcastle, who um, they did a whole study where they recruited overweight dads and they intervened entirely on the dad. The dad had improved and so did the kids in their behaviors. Um, so, you know, just um, thinking about the mechanism, it's sort of uh, target for intervention, but also I think there's lots to learn about what exactly is, exactly that is it that they're encouraging more of those behaviors, it's modeling it. So what are what do you, um, so and in the study in Australia they did um, more roughhouse play with uh, that's they taught them like how do you do that in a way that's fun for kids like not where you're pinning them down all the time but like where it's enjoyable to them and so that's they did sort of um, some stuff to sort of explore you know how are dads playing with their kids how can we make it more active and those kind of things so there's more interest but we don't have no we don't know the whole mechanism of how. It's just kind of sad because I have three older brothers. All of them are obese, obese, obese and they all have kids. I'm just like, okay. <laughs> I'm just like, what's happening? So, uh -huh. uh -huh. It's often, it can be a window of opportunity in that we have, in our study, as I showed you, um, a number of the parents are overweight and obese, but they are really keen to think about what can I do differently with um, getting. They're, when we ask them why they're in the study, they're like, I'm here because I want to I want to get healthier and I want my kids to be healthier too. That's the main reason they're there. Another thing is, um, like, does the study actually change the behaviors of the families? Sure. So I'm happy. So, yeah, I didn't present it, but we actually have an intervention arm. So we randomize families to receive um, uh, home visits or not. So home visits where a health educator goes into the home and they work with the entire family unit to create health goals. Um, so both parents will be together to think about what are the goals we have around improving our child's behavior. Um, the, uh, the health educators use motivational interviewing. So instead of saying, these are the behaviors you're going to change, the families themselves identify what behaviors they want to change, what motivates them, what gets them excited about the change, and then the health educator supports them through that. So that's how, that's the intervention we're testing on whether or not it actually changes behavior. So you're doing that for all the families or just random? So we're, random we're randomizing. Okay. So some families get that and yeah. some people don't as a way to make sure we test whether or not it actually works. Yeah. You talk about nutrition a fair bit. Are there differences in how eating disorders affect men? Oh, so are you talking about eating disorders among the parents or among the kids? Among the parents. Um, so, um, there is some research on, so I, so I know more, um, the stuff we've done around disorder dating and eating disorders has definitely been among more adolescents and young adults. I do know of some qualitative studies that have explored what's it like to have uh, currently have an eating disorder or um, have had one in the past in transition to parenthood. The, the folk, that focus we barely know of mothers. Um, I don't know of fathers. Um, I know of some great researchers looking at eating disorders in males. Um, and the Growing Up Today study has done some of that work too because of course it's a large sample and we have lots of them. Um, um, and really interesting stuff both on males in general and then also um, sexual minority youth and what do eating disorders look like in sexual minority youth in both men and women, um, which had really interesting uh, results. But what I don't, I do not know, so I'm gonna go look to see if there's any about fathering after you've had a, you know, um, either you have an eating disorder had one in the past. Along those lines, yeah. it's interesting that uh, it's a very small minority of people, uh, men, men who have a restricting uh, eating disorder, but obesity seems to be quite a bit more prevalent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if it has to do with cultural pressures. Mm -hmm. which, uh, Oh, absolutely, and I think um, you're right. In our adult population in Canada, males there's a higher percentage of males who are overweight or obese than females. Um, we 
we do see a fair bit of restricting um, intersection minority males would be more uh, higher rates of restricting disordered teen behaviors. Um, but you're right, in the um, in heterosexual men, they're often lower. But it's not non-existent. Like we see, um, we still see disordered teen behaviors because I think the pressure. Um, so for ages, you're right that I think the media, for example, focused mainly on women and focused on the thin ideal. But marketers figured out it works just as well to make sure men feel um, less than. And yeah, um, and so the marketing now definitely has um, focused on um, a muscular ideal for men, for sure. Um, so we definitely see, we do have some uh, reported this happy note to end on but um, <laughs> thank you again this was really lovely to be here and um, feel free to email me if you have any other further questions or other studies that can help you find I'm happy to do it actually I was going to suggest that um, if there are additional studies we could obviously make them on our website yes I'm happy to send some so yeah okay. and as I said we're writing this grant right now so I will have more and more fatherhood grants to or, or studies to share with you, which I'm happy to. If there's anything we can do to help find fathers, you know, yes, yes. Very yeah, you might be the you are the right place. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Well, another round of applause for Jeff. So, everybody, stick around. We do have food. Actually, we still have a lot of food. Um, and if you don't eat it, then I eat it. And that's not good for my nutrition. So we want all of us to participate in eating a mix of good and less nutritious foods. So uh, stick around. Uh, Jess, you're going to be around for a little I bit longer. If there's more questions, Thank you, Oscar. Uh, our next event, we're going to be back at U of T for a film screening. It's the film The Red Pill, which is getting a lot of buzz. Um, I will uh, bring up some posters that I have uh, downstairs and put some out, out here. So if you want to take that away and help us get the word out about that event, it's uh, going to be December 2nd. Um, Friday night at, uh, at U of T. Uh, there's also an email list on the shelf by the door. Uh, if you want to find out more about all the various things that we do, we're a fairly busy organization. Get reminders about that event and all the other events, which we host roughly once a month, and do sign up there. Otherwise, you can come see me if you have any questions. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.